I am now pleased, really pleased, to be able to introduce Madeline Gould when the DART Center first started getting interested in suicide as an issue a couple years ago. Maddie Gould was one of the first people who we called, and she's been a rich resource ever since. Um, I'm, let me just say I'm going to give you these bios, even though you're, they're in your packet, because we are doing this for the tape and for posterity, as well as for those of you in the room. Um, so, Madeline Gould, PhD, MPH, is a professor of clinical epidemiology and psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, and a research scientist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Her longstanding research interests include the epidemiology of youth suicide, as well as the evaluation of youth suicide prevention interventions. Uh, Dr. Gould has received numerous federally funded grants from the National Institutes of Mental Health, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration for studies examining risk factors for teenage suicide, various aspects of uh, cluster suicides, the impact of the media on suicide, the effect of a peer suicide on fellow students, and suicide postvention programs in schools. Um, she's received numerous awards uh, from AFSP and elsewhere. I know her as a person who is not only an expert in her own special field of youth suicide and prevention, something at the core of our agenda today, but as one of those wonderful experts who are masters of literature in the field. I know that if I want to know where the expertise lies, I can turn to Maddie and she will tell me. And she is also a master of the data if we want to talk about risk, if we want to talk about prevention and what works. I can't think of a better person to give an overview than Maddie Gould. Right. And she'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have a conversation. All right, thanks so much. It really is a um, pleasure to be here. And as Bob, Gebby, and I were just talking very briefly to see sort of the culmination of really decades of, um, you know, trying to um, grapple with covering, you know, reporting of, of suicide in the, in the media. And that, you know, if we had given this overview, you know, three decades ago, there really wouldn't have been all that much to say. But there's been a, a really an enormous amount of evidence that's been accumulated to support the idea that suicidal behavior is contagious and that it can be transmitted directly or indirectly from, person, from one person to another person. And that the evidence for, um, comes from three bodies of research. One, the impact of the media. Another on cluster suicides and another on uh, exposure to a suicidal here. Um, most of the research has been focused on the uh, impact of the media. That's what I'll be focusing on today. Okay. Thank you. And that there is a related topic, but distinctly different, with regard to the um, contagion of non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. I'm not going to be focusing on that. I'm specifically going to be dealing with attempted and completed suicide. Uh, Professor Nock is an expert in this area, so as Bruce said, I know when to, <laughs> to suggest talking with other folks. And so um, really, with regard to non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, there's no better person um, to address your, your questions to. Okay, that when we... Um, have this dialogue, and with regard to being a public health professional and a professional in the area of suicide prevention, our main concerns with regard to the media's impact are twofold. One is that the possible, and I say possible, certainly not always, uh, promotion of suicide contagion or modeling, um, but equally important is the potential, again, potential, hopefully something to avoid, promulgation of misinformation and misperceptions about um, suicide risks and natures of suicide prevention. So I'll first focus on what we know about suicide contagion and the media, and then about um, you know, misinformation and misperceptions. 
And I'll first start by just defining what we mean by suicide contagion or modeling, and it's the process by which knowledge of one suicide facilitates or influences the occurrence of a subsequent suicide. How that happens, um, we really don't quite understand, but one way that it is um, conjectured to work is within a larger context of behavioral contagion or social learning theory. And that, um, you know, according to social learning theory, most human behavior is learned observationally through modeling. And we can discuss, I mean, there's tons of evidence for, um, you know, for social learning theory. And that uh, modeling of suicidal behavior really does fit within that umbrella with regard to our understanding of how it might, might work. So to date, there are over 50, about 55 studies that uh, examine the impact of non-fictional coverage of suicidal behavior. So this is about real people who have died by suicide. Um, and uh, research has found a significant, significant increase in completed suicide following such stories. There are about a handful of stories that aren't consistent, and these were done uh, prior to 1990, and that, but the vast majority of studies have been consistent. There's a smaller body of uh, research that has focused on fictional stories, and some of my earlier work did that. Um, that's more complicated, not as consistent, really don't quite understand, and um, the evidence for modeling after such stories is um, equivocal. So that I'm going to be focusing on what is consistent, and that's with regard to the coverage of um, you know, real folk suicides and stories about suicide. And this slide summarizes you know, these you know, 50 some odd studies. With regard to the situations that do seem to um, yield a greater increase in suicide. And that's more likely to happen when the frequency of the stories increase. And that's called a dose response effect. That more coverage, the greater the likelihood that you'll find an increase in. And, this, and most of the studies have looked at completed suicide. Some have looked at attempted suicide, but the vast majority have actually looked at you know, people dying by suicide. Um, Studies have also shown that there's more likely to have an increase and the increase will be greater when a higher proportion of the population is exposed, when the headlines are dramatic, and when the prominence of the story increases. So that if a story is on the front page, you're more apt to get a significant increase in completed, completed suicide following that story than if it is in a subsequent page or section of the, of the newspaper. And more recently, there have been studies that have been um, starting to examine the impact of stories on the in internet as well. You know, this is an area that's just beginning, but there are consistent studies also. And that um, I neglected to put my uh, email address on that first slide, so I'll do it now, because, you know, I have some references on each of the slides. I'm happy to share these slides. I didn't know if you were planning to do that. But if you do want to reach me, my um, email address is msg5 at columbia.edu. And I can give you references for each of these studies so that you don't, it's not just me <laughs> making up, deciding to make things up for this, for this presentation. Um, and that in addition to that increase, though, that we do see studies that report on a converse effect that show a decrease in suicide. And those situations have been following, um, in this case, we're calling them media guidelines. It was, and I'll show you in the next slide, something that was done in another country where people feel comfortable using the word guidelines. In the United States, um, and I'm not being facetious about it, we really thought about it, and they're recommendations. This is voluntary. This is a collaboration. You know, we want to work with you, and you work with us, and so guidelines seem a little too stringent or, or formal. Um, but I'll show you the extent to which suicides can decrease after um, the implementation of, in this case, media guidelines. And another study that looked at uh, the impact during newspaper strikes when stories weren't being covered, and they found a subsequent uh, decrease in suicides, which you know lends uh, confidence that we can actually do something um, about decreasing suicide rates. And that this was the evidence from the media guidelines. Um, in Vienna, the main uh, method 
for dying by suicide is on, in their subway system. And so in 1987, this goes back a ways, there was the implementation of media guidelines that focused on you know, this particular method. And that you can see a, let's see, does this have a, no. That uh, there was a substantial drop in um, the rate of deaths by suicide on the Vienna subway system in, after the implementation of these guidelines, and it was about a 75% decrease in uh, suicide. And again, it shows that it is possible to modify suicide contagion. That I want to sort of full disclosure that most of these studies are what's called ecological studies, rather than at an individual level. They'll look at differences in completed suicide rates in communities that had coverage and areas that didn't have coverage or over time, but you're looking at data at an aggregate level, so it would be groups of people rather than you know individuals. But that more recently, there have been some individual level studies that have been conducted and the results are consistent, that people in emergency rooms will report that they were exposed to a drama on, you know, on TV or you know, some media reports of celebrity suicides um, and that reporting that it did impact them as well. And that in epidemiology, and I'm not, you know, I'll just spend a moment on this, but again, just to sort of um, provide the, the gravity for the amount of evidence and the, um, the uh, reliability of this information, that in, in epidemiology, there are a number of criteria that are used. You know, it's an observational science, um, epidemiology. We don't experiment. On people, we take the nat, you know, use natural, um, uh, natural quote experiments, but we observe, you know, associations. So that most of the studies that I'm reporting have been, you know, associations. It's not as if we're putting people in a booth and bombarding them. Although we can be doing that in collaborations, and I'm sure Matt Knock will be talking about that as well. But in epidemiology, it is observational, so that we have to rely on other you know, criteria for causality. Number one, are the studies consistent? You know, and so that even regardless of study design and populations uh, studied, that the associations have been um, uh, consistent. And that with regard to the strength of the association, it means if you have more coverage, you know, is there a dose response effect? And as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, there is. And that we see that in terms of temporality, that the increase is after the story, not before the story. So, I mean, in certain cases, the story can be driven by an increase in suicide rates. If you're talking about the military, if there are now more stories about the military uh, suicides, it's not because, and then you look at the rates of military suicides, it's the story that's being driven by the increase. Um, but there are enough stories that have shown you know, enough research articles that have shown that the increase is actually after the story and that some natural experiments that there's an increase after story, then it goes back down, and then the story comes out again, and then, you know, a subsequent increase. Um, with regard to uh, specificity, that's a little more limited, but there are some studies that have shown that at least people are reporting that they've been exposed to um, media and that it's impacted on them. And then it's certainly coherent with, we know that the media influences attitudes and behavior in many other areas. So it's really not surprising that it should impact people in this area as well. Um, but luckily, the impact of the media isn't monolithic. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. You know, if it's just like, you know, we're not here to say don't report on suicide. It would be contrary to what we want. We want people to be aware that there's a, a problem, a public health problem. Uh, what we want the emphasis to be on is suicide prevention, as Bob Gebbia said earlier and, and other folks have said. Um, and interactive factors do exist, that the impact is, is clearly a function of the audience or could be called the observer's pre-existing vulnerability. Someone who doesn't have a pre-existing vulnerability, who gets to read about a story or hear it on the TV, will feel sympathetic, you know, may feel sad, but as in, it's not going to increase that person's motivation to uh, die by suicide. And that there have been studies that have shown that the, the impact of media is stronger if someone does, is depressed already, has a history of suicidal behavior already. The characteristics of the stories, or you know, what we consider the, the models, 
um, you know, play a role, and I'll be talking about some content analyses in just a moment, but you know, as I mentioned, more prominent coverage, front page coverage, makes a difference. And then this match between the story and the observer is a, is a key that there is differential identification that will play a role. There are stories that have shown that in Japan that if the person who's being reported about who dies by suicide is Japanese, that that will lead to subsequent increase in completed suicide among the Japanese population. If it's someone else, another race, it didn't increase the rates of suicide. There's also something that's called vertical identification in that whether you're identifying with someone not sort of at the same level with you, but let's say a celebrity, and that celebrity, a, de a death by suicide by a celebrity is much more apt, that story is much more apt to yield a significant increase in completed suicide than a suicide by someone who's had, had a criminal history. But this horizontal identification, so if someone's more similar to you, if you're reading a story about a, a young woman um, who dies by suicide, the rates are more likely to increase among young women, uh, older men, old, you know, and so on. And so that it's that match that we have to consider as well, so that when we talk about what are the implications of these um, findings for prevention, which I'm sure will be some of our dialogue, you know, that's something to consider, that if your story is about a specific group, then prevention strategies that you want to suggest or resources that you want to give, you know, my, you might be better served to focus on what's available for that particular group, whether it's veterans, whether it's you know active duty folks, whether it's you know older folks or or teenagers. So I just want to um, talk about uh, some results from content analyses as well. That this is a um, study that was done out of Hungary, um, but they examined newspaper reports from six countries that had markedly different suicide rates. And the, um, the content analyses are usually a qualitative analysis, and so it examined the, the nature of the media reports and that what they concluded was that media were more accepting of suicides in countries with higher suicide rates, such as Hungary and Japan, and that countries with lower rates, Germany, Finland, and the US, um, when a suicide occurred, it had some negative connotations to it, whether it portrayed the victim and act in terms of, I mean, they considered it negative, you know, in certain cases it's true, psychopathology, or uh, emphasizing the negative consequences, you know, of a suicide, rather than making it, you know, and I could have given some examples, but for want of time I didn't. Um, you see some coverage that makes suicide appear to be heroic. Um, and that they'll sometimes even use the word heroic, you know, or in this, yeah, it could be in the headline or in the content of the story. It's the balance of trying to raise awareness, be sensitive to survivors' needs, and the love and care that they uh, may have given to the, a family member before someone died. And you can describe the person's good qualities, but you don't want to provide the act, make it at all seem as if it's a heroic act, and that we see that across different countries, and it, you know, at least it's correlated with these uh, different rates. Um, other stories, and I want to highlight, I don't think you can see it because of the table, but there's, in the title, um, it has the term Werther versus Papageno effects, and um, that's what I really want to highlight. This was a content analysis of over, you know, about 500 suicide-related print media reports. And what they found, and what I really want to, and this is the, the moral of my presentation today, is that the, there can be a very positive effect of the media. Um, and not just when stories aren't reported, that there can be a positive effect on reducing suicide rates when stories are shaped in different ways. And so that it was called the Papageno effect based on Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, when the Papageno overcame a suicidal crisis. And it's the second bullet that's, as far as I'm concerned, more important, because the first bullet just repeats what we've been saying, is that if you emphasize the adoption of coping strategies other than suicidal behavior in adverse circumstances, that was associated with a decrease 
in uh, suicide rates. So that there are other types of stories to consider. Um, not just stories about people dying by suicide, but by, by you know, stories about people who have survived wanting to die by suicide, you know, by nature of, you know, other um, strategies that they use to cope with this, you know, these problems. And then we've done a content analysis of stories um, that were associated with the initiation of clusters. Uh, we have a case control study of cluster communities and uh, where I think, you know, folks on this end had mentioned that you're grappling in Delaware with, so I think most people are aware of what I mean by, uh, you know, a cluster of youth suicides occurring in a relatively small geographic area over a relatively short period of time. And that we wanted to see whether, and this was funded by, um, well, the study was funded by a NIMH, but this particular part of it was funded by AFSP with regard to looking at the, um, the characteristics of stories following of the death by suicide of a young person who unfortunately then subsequent suicides occurred and created a suicide cluster, in contrast to other towns where you had the tragedy of that death by suicide, but it didn't seem to spark other uh, suicides. And what we saw is that there were more newspaper stories following a first victim that then seemed to trigger or initiate a cluster. There were more stories about the first, uh, the, the particularly about that first person. There was more prominent coverage with regard to story placement, size of headlines, presence of a picture, uh, more sympathetic coverage in the content and in pictures. And what was distressing, no explanation, and that we see that a lot, no explanation of, and other people have found this as well, of suicide other than mentioning some school or work problems, uh, and then more personal details about the victim as well. And I had mentioned that, you know, we've seen a 75% decrease in subway suicides after that media guidelines, and I just wanted to give you some, you know, very global um, estimate of what the magnitude of the increase can be. And, you know, after, you know, people have used this as sort of the prototypical example, but with regard to after Meyer Ellen Monroe's death, you know, there being about a 12% increase. So it's a real, you know, increase. But the decrease, luckily, was, you know, much larger. So I just want to now very quickly, and it will be quickly, um, get into you know, misinformation, misperceptions, and I um, chose to talk about bullying because I thought it could focus some of the dis you know, discussion that's on for this afternoon as well. More and more we see coverage like this, you know, that you know, someone is, quote, bullied to death. And um, you know, the typical media message is that bullying causes suicide. This does not tell the full story. So suicide risk may be substantially mediated by other factors, and I know that there'll be a lot more detail this afternoon about it, but this is one area, and it's just one example, you know, there, there are other examples about, you know, in terms of misinformation, but this is the prominent one right now with regard to, um, you know, stories about the impact of bullying, and then the impression that it gives with regard to um, folks thinking, well, I'm bullied, then I should be, you know, perhaps uh, suicidal. And that there is something that's called descriptive norms uh, with regard to thinking of behavior is very, very common and that it's normative. And that if there have been study, if this is a little bit of a side, so I'll just be very brief, but there have been studies of, of high school students asking them about use of drugs and alcohol, asking them if they've used it, and to the extent that other kids use it. And that they way overestimate the extent to which other kids use alcohol or drugs. I mean, really, they practically think that it is normative. Many of, you know, most kids use it. But what the studies have shown longitudinally is that those kids who think that it's very common, even when they're not using it in ninth grade, by the time they're in 12th grade, they're more likely to be, you know, using these substances. So we're concerned about the messages about suicide. You know, we want it to be about suicide prevention, but we don't want to give the impression that, well, it's just so common that everybody's doing it so that somehow the norms get, get shifted. But I want to end by putting what is, you know, the keynote in context, because there are a myriad of factors that contribute to suicidal behavior. We're focusing on the impact of the media, these journalists, but I, again, want to put it in context. So 
how does a suicide occur? You know, this is the, the model that I'm using as a, as a shorthand, and there are other models that, you know, people can um, use that are, very, that are very useful. But I'll just, um, you know, give this brief overview. There needs to be some underlying vulnerability um, in order. Now, that doesn't mean that it's obvious, and it doesn't mean that you have it for life. You know, you may have some underlying vulnerability because of circumstances, uh, but that, that at least put you at greater likelihood, and I'll talk, talk to you about the next step, but whether it's a mood disorder or substance abuse or aggression or anxiety or impulsivity, sexual orientation, some biological factors, family characteristics, including a history of suicidal behavior, sexual abuse or physical abuse or social adversity. You know, 25, 30 years ago, that slide would have said mood disorder so that we now know that we know so much more about the factors that may contribute to increasing suicide risk. The good news is um, even with that underlying vulner vulnerability, most people will not engage in suicidal behavior and that it usually is triggered by some stress event. With young people, it's usually getting in trouble with law or school or loss or being bullied. I mean, clearly bullying can act as a trigger and that this in turn you know, can create a, an acute mood change, whether it's anxiety or dread or hopelessness or anger. Unfortunately, there are situations and, and circumstances that can facilitate then someone engaging in suicidal uh, behavior, whether a lethal method is available, whether there's a recent example of someone's death or attempt in the community, and then media displays and the internet, you know, as I've been talking about. But I just wanted to put it in that context of where it Plays, they play a role. Fortunately, there are factors that can inhibit someone's, um, you know, engaging in suicidal behavior, whether it's family cohesion, a couple of studies, not many on religiosity, but, you know, the idea of having support, emotional and available, you know, uh, support from people, help-seeking attitudes uh, by young people. And again, I put the media displays and internet on that side as well, because it has that power to um, promote uh, healthy coping strategies and how you may report um, the story could inhibit someone engaging in the behavior. And so, you know, it does show us that there's this media paradox in that both negative and positive effects of the media are observed. And I think it's all our challenge to uh, tip that balance of the media uh, in favor of what's been called the propaganda effect rather than the Werther effect. There have been just now a, a few studies that have actually measured uh, the impact on the style of media reporting about suicide before and after recommendations um, were launched. Um, more not, not this study that was done a, a while ago, but now before and after trainings for editors and journalists and so on. And so this is where I'm going to end because I think that that's our challenge now to see well what do we have to do to tip that you know to tip that balance. Okay. Excellent. Thank All you. All right. Sure. Um, I'll leave that up. Thanks, Jackson. Do you have about 20 minutes? Can I get a mic here? We'll need this and this both. Um, there we go. Um, we have about 15, 20 minutes for conversation. I'm going to throw a couple of things your okay. way, but then we'll just sort of open it up to the room. I, I love the idea as someone who likes opera, I love the idea that <laughs> two different opera characters are now going to frame this conversation. Um, let's talk about Vienna, speaking of opera, I okay. guess. Um, you, you mentioned this, the Vienna study and the, the guidelines. I think it might be interesting for folks here to hear a little bit more about what those guidelines were, what, what was really responsible for that very dramatic change that right. we saw on your slide. What was going on and what was responsible for that dramatic yep. change? Uh, you know, I think that it's probably similar to recommendations that have been developed more recently. Um, I think one key factor is the engagement of media. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they did. It wasn't as if they just had these recommendations and you know, left them. So these suicides had been, what, what was happening in Vienna before oh, the Oh, well they had a high, you know, there was a um, high rate of suicides on the subway system. You know, a similar problem has, was in Toronto, you know, a decade mm -hmm. ago that they, you know, grappled with in a similar way. Mm -hmm. And um, the recognition that this was the way that folks died by suicide. 
And were, and each, were each of those typically reported in, in the And they were these? prominently yeah. reported okay. in the media and um, graphically reported in the media, pictures reported in the media, and repetitive reporting, which we now know from the studies that I've summarized briefly, that it is just that circumstance that even if the stories, you know, it's this cycle that there may be this occurrence and cultural factors that, I'm going to just step aside from that so it doesn't do that, um, that would have made that method attractive, but reporting on it repetitively in a dramatic way in a way becomes an advertisement. Mm -hmm. And it becomes an advertisement for that being a lethal method. Mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes what we want to do is just shape, shape the story. I mean, hopefully someone wouldn't engage in suicidal behavior. But if you are, I'm trying to figure out if it's me or the sound. But if you are going to engage in suicidal behavior, we want people to use a non-lethal method so that there's some chance of, be, of surviving it. And so that the guidelines that were um, implemented and disseminated at that time really did discuss trying to avoid repetitive repeating, you know, I mean repetitive reporting of the story, and that if they did report it, to try not to use graphic pictures of it, uh, to try to um, put resources in the stories, you know, as well, and that in your packet, as you look at the recommendations that are in there, they're actually, you know, similar type work of recommendations. One of the challenges I think everybody in this room has contended with is, which is common in other kinds of news reporting as well, is that what we think of as news, yeah. what becomes headlines, are very typically the least common, the right. most unusual suicides. Right. Someone leaping off the George Washington Bridge, right. uh, a young person, doesn't happen very often. Much less common than uh, much more conventional kinds of suicide attempts on college campuses. Um, how does the reporting of the extraordinary rather than the most common affect public understanding of this issue, yeah. do you think? That is a challenge. And there have been studies that have looked that, just as you say, there's a disproportionate coverage of murder-suicides. I mean, I think most people think that murder-suicides really what, you know, are, you know, are involved with suicide, that most suicides are murder-suicides, which it's just not, it's not the case. And it clearly then has such implications for what people will think about the suicide victim and what needed to be done with regard to the prevention of that suicide. And um, I think that when methods are so dramatic, and we can t get into that conversation of what is news, quote, newsworthy, because now with the internet, that's really becoming uh, more of an issue. But I think that, number one, it really gets people's attention. Um, and it I think, and other folks may, you know, want to chime in as well, uh, creates the misinformation that suicide is not preventable. Because when you think of someone leaping from the door, I mean, we can have barriers and so on, and we're trying to do that. So sometimes they, they have good ramifications. In, on the Golden Gate Bridge, finally, they're going to be putting up, you know, netting and so on. And so maybe sometimes it takes that to have a positive effect. But um, I think that it gives the impression that, for the most part, suicide is impulsive, that it's not preventable, and that, again, it's misinformation with regard to the nature of the type of person who engages in suicidal behavior. And for the most part, even though I've said, you know, I had that big slide underlying vulnerability, you know, through the course of a 30-year career, I realized that, I would hazard a guess, that most people can, given the, quote, perfect storm 
can be in that situation. And that's a recognition that I think people should have so it doesn't seem like an other, you know, versus me mm -hmm. situation. You know, if you recognize that most people are vulnerable, can be vulnerable to suicide at different points mm -hmm. in their life, whether it's, you know, you don't realize that you have that vulnerability and then you, you know, you get deployed and redeployed and so on and it depletes, you know, whatever coping strategies that you have or that you become so sleep deprived and you didn't realize that you had that vulnerability to depression and then all of a sudden you find yourself sleep deprived. I'm sort of going on a tangent. Mm -hmm. But um, it's the misinformation. So that's the bottom line. That's my answer. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Thoughts, queries from, from the floor? Kate has the microphone, so anybody? Um, yes. Is there uh, any studies on how gender plays into contagion? Because I, I'm just thinking about psychogenic illnesses that tends to affect young girls sort of disproportionately, and I wonder if there's any similarities. There. Yeah. Um, I'll back up just for a moment that we know with regard to suicide attempts, girls attempt slightly more, not all that much more, but a little more, US. With regard to deaths by suicide, the rates are much higher, you know, about five to one. Uh, for young people, middle-aged people, 10 to one. For older men to women, many more men to women. Um, the deaths by suicide may be a function of method, that if you look at, uh, in fact, the most dramatic change, I'll say, is in China, where the rates among women were much higher, that they were by overdoses, which is what women will do in the US as well, but they were overdoses by uh, lethal pesticides. And the rates tended to be higher among women in rural communities where there was access to lethal pesticides. Um, at the last International Association of Suicide Prevention meetings that were held in Beijing, there were, you know, there were uh, folks reporting on the dramatic decrease in uh, rates of deaths by suicide among women in China in rural areas because of a change in uh, storage of lethal pesticides. And so that now it's in a central depository, you just don't have access to it, and the, the rates have come down. And there's lots of evidence that shows decreasing means to, le you know, access to lethal means. All right, so that's the, that's the background. With regard to contagion and your question, there is that differential identification, so that if the model is a female, be more likely to be a female. But from our study of cluster suicides, there were no, that for the most part, the demographic characteristics of those people who died, the young people who died in clusters compared to those who did not die in a, you know, they died by suicide but not in a cluster situation, followed the demographic distribution generally of suicide, which is more prevalent among young boys. So that there's no evidence per se that suicide contagion is more an issue among girls than, you know, than among, than among boys. And that when we did see situations where girls were involved, very often it was a pact with a boy or some, you know, after, uh, you know, but there were some relationship issues that were involved as well. But overall, the girls don't seem to be more vulnerable. So, yeah, so that's it. So I, I realize that the pattern to my answers are, I go here, 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 and then, <laughs> Try to get back to the, get back to the well, answer. Well, but that's because you're a good researcher. Yeah. The, the dots get connected <laughs> in a big circle leading in rather than nice straight well, line. Thank you for your patience. So, so, yeah. Someone else, yes. Randy. Yeah, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more, if you could amplify anything on the, uh, on the internet research that's been yeah. done. And then also what about social media because that's how information about suicide gets yeah. shared often on campus. Yeah. Uh, actually, there was a re I'll start with the, with the social media first and work my way into the internet. Um, there was a, a study that came out recently by um, Dan Romer, who's at the Annenberg School of, uh, you know, I don't know if it's called public policy or communication, but he's the director of their, you know, adolescent risk division. And that um, they examined waves of you know, different, it was a longitudinal study looking at, there's a, um, it's called the Ad Her Health, but uh, I can get you that, you know, reference as well, although I may have it here. But what they found was they wanted to see 
how young people were uh, exposed to the to suicide on on the internet, what the different sources were, and then look at the difference between those people at time one who were suicidal or not suicidal. Looked at them time two as a function of you know the exposure at time one to see what might have an impact increasing suicidal ideation. Turned out it was not social media per se, but it was the engagement in chat uh, sessions, that if they were exposed to suicide in chat forums, that they were much more likely to be, and they weren't suicidal, at least according to the self-report, they weren't suicidal at the first assessment. By the second assessment a year later, they would be more likely to be suicidal. Whether it was the chat that was influencing them or self-selection of why did they go to the chat? Maybe they weren't suicidal, but maybe they were having other problems. Um, so, you know, again, it's hard sometimes to really make a conclusion about the cause and effect. But with regard to highlighting areas on the internet that we really, as public health professionals, want to focus on, it's these unsupervised chat discussions that we're concerned about. In contrast to, you know, with Ashley here, the, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is, you know, has initiated crisis chat services. Now that's very, very different, where you have a vulnerable, you know, a vulnerable person talking one-on-one -on -one with someone who has the skills to, to interact. In contrast to, you know, say a bunch of young people just talking where sometimes, you know, unfortunately, um, people will promote the idea of suicidal behavior. Then there have been other studies that have looked at community surveys in Japan, looking at the association of um, internet use and, you know, suicidal ideation and behavior, and, and they're correlated. Uh, or the prevalence of internet usage generally in um, different cross-national studies as well. But there have just been a few, um, but more and more now people are interested in what's been called internet addiction and studies that have shown that, you know, especially among young people, those who are prone to, and now there are, um, there's diagnostic cl classification, not that it's a diagnostic disorder at this point, but there are criteria in terms of internet addiction with regard to usage and so on and needing it more and that it's definitely associated with greater suicidal ideation and, and behavior. But more and more people are starting to study the internet, their you know, methodologic challenges, but also more and more luckily, and this is what I'm trying to do, is use it for prevention and intervention you know, purposes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I can get you that Dan Romer or you can Google, Google Romer, R-O-M-E-R. It's a miracle with Google. You get <laughs> practically any reference, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah Kelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm interested in your thoughts about the uh, uh, dynamics between a public uh, suicide and a private one, which I think also might have uh, impact on the social media thing. There's a, definitely a subterranean conversation yes. going on that most people either are unaware of or if they are aware of it, they don't know what to do about it. But there's a very dark conversation going on below the surface and I wondered if you could talk about the public versus private aspect. Yeah, um, I'll talk about that sort of dark underbelly that we have to be aware of because when we have um, you know, consulted not for pay, <laughs> you know, with communities and schools. And in the past, you didn't have to deal with social media. You know, in working with schools that were experiencing the tragedy of a suicide cluster and how to contain it and so on, that, you know, there were some more and more tried and true procedures that you could do in schools and trying to identify youngsters at risk and how to talk about the situation and so on. Now, and I think it was with, you know, Wiley and folks from Lifeline as well to, um, oh, and Chris Lee uh, as well, to try to come up with recommendations of how to identify what was going, what was that story that was being told and shared in the internet and how to 
try to uh, work with the family, work with friends, so that you could um, start to see what was being posted on the deceased web, on uh, you know, profile and so on, because there were shrine, you know, you don't want a shrine being set up in the back of the school, but there were these shrines being set up on the internet. And so it's a challenge, um, but we know that communication is key with regard to increasing the likelihood that someone is going to be influenced by somebody else's suicide, and so that now there is that social media connection. But you also brought up the public suicide and more private suicide, and that we know from our own data, and this is where, again, it becomes such a difficult situation. What makes a story newsworthy, is the, which is its public nature, is the same thing that makes it more likely to initiate a suicide cluster. So that it's such a tragedy, clearly, if someone dies in their own home, but it's less likely to influence somebody else's suicide than if it's you ju jumping off the George Washington Bridge or that you take a gun to a party and you shoot yourself in front of your friends. Um, you know, or you go, these are real situations, obviously not making them up, or you drive your car to the schoolyard and you, you know, then get out and hang yourself, you know, and so on where everybody's, you know, going to see you. So that's the challenge and I, I would say, what is newsworthy and what do we do about that? And that um, at least when it's the print media, there can be some conversations between editors and reporters and so on, I understand where you can take some time to really grapple with what's newsworthy. When it's the internet and everything now is going so quickly and it's before you even get the right story up, because I know Wiley has seen that, before the story is, you know, the facts aren't even known, it's out there. And once it's out there, even if you try to correct what was misinformation, the misinformation is out there forever. So that's the cha that's a challenge now. What do we do? What do we do about that? Because I, I don't think we're going to be able to slow down the rate by which things become public. Mm -hmm. You know now. You know, and that the decision making is. I know that I think we were on the same conference call trying to figure out what was newsworthy, and I was really concerned about, you know, what so much of what I've talked about is print media and how to grapple with the internet, you know, e-stories is a whole other issue because of that's the speed by, and that it's an undercurrent in how do we, you know, what do we do about it? So I, you know, I sort of putting the question back to all of us, you know, that you raised to me. Yeah. Natalie. Um, there was a slew of suicides, particularly in Italy and Greece this summer, um, and the media just quickly tied them to the economic crisis there. Right. Is that just a simplistic answer and, um, you know, there's been marches, there's been marches, but the, instead of like about getting help for the suicidal, it's more about the, the government is bad. Yeah, no, I think you've answered your own question. It is simplistic, but that's not to say that the, you know, unemployment and economic situation doesn't influence suicide and that the, with adults, not with kids. Yeah. And, the and studies that have yeah. shown. And Chris Rune will be talking about this a little bit later in the day. Oh, too, okay. So that's good. This. But again, it gives that same simplistic message as bullying, that just that alone causes suicide. And it's never, it's never that alone. And then it, I mean, I do think we need to fix our economic situation and that will help things generally. Um, but it then gives the impression that suicide prevention doesn't need to entail all, you know, the screening, the identification of risk, the, the development of, you know, coping strategy, you know, so, so many other uh, uh, programs that can be put into place. So it is simplistic, but that there is, you know, some reality to it, you know, that there have been a number of studies that mainly, again, ecological, you know, rather than at an individual level, but that have shown an association between, you know, unemployment and, you know, economic disadvantages and, um, you know, suicide risk. But it's simplistic. So let's do one more question. <clears throat> sure. Um, I've tried to sort through 
a lot of the research on clusters, and some of it's yeah. quite confusing. It is confusing. Uh, <laughs> one one of the much. questions I have, and, and I hope you can clarify for me, how do you decide what's a reasonable amount of time between a suicide, a well-publicized one, and subsequent suicides right. to count as clustering? Yeah. Oh, like that's a, a, a year question. later, if you have four teen suicides and four years in the same high school, is that a cluster? Does it have to be within months of each other? How do we think that social learning theory uh, plays out right. over such long stretches of time? Right. So right. that's one question. And the, I guess the other question is, have there been any studies which have asked whether or not declaring a group of suicides as a cluster increases the likelihood of more suicides? Right. In other words, is there a labeling yeah. effect? Right. Um, you know, when we did our study, you, know, you do a study, you have to come up with a standardized definition and you base it on, you know, whatever prior research is available. And most of the research had shown a relatively short period of time between people who seem to be related. So, you know, for our study, we had said, well, a cluster had to be within a three month period initially. And, you know, this was in a town or, you know, city of, you know, residents of occurrence. And then we found out, oh, look at this. There were these overlapping <laughs> three month periods. And, um, and then saw, you know, what we thought was the first death. Actually, there had been a death a year before that seemed to trigger, you know, a few other deaths later, and that people were telling us that. You know, we'd go to interview the family members and friends and so on of, quote, the first uh, death by suicide, and they'd say, you know what, it, it was really, you know, Johnny. Um, and so I think that the recommendations that the Centers for Disease Control, you know, provided in the early 1990s, you know, and I remember being in that, in that meeting room where we said, if the, com if the community thinks it's a cluster, then for all intents and purposes, it is a cluster because mm. you're going to have to react and implement programs and strategies and crisis response as if it's a cluster. And so I don't, I mean, again, for a research project, you just, for standardization, you need to, you know, use, you know, diff, you know some, some criteria. But for public health practice, I think that we need to be, you know, a little more flexible. Now, what we did, so that's with regard to the timing, which is why it's so confusing. But that we've seen there are different patterns. And the thing that was very concerning to us were two instances. Once the cohort that was exposed to the cluster uh, was identified or they experienced that trauma, it did, the risk didn't go away. That we saw subsequent, they called, uh, most recently, Annette Beautre, who's now in New Zealand, has called them echo clusters, and that we've seen them occur. You know, that we you know, had our study going, over, uh, going on for a number of years, and so, there was a cluster, and then two years later, same town, another cluster, but instead of the kids being 16 and 17, you know, they were 18 and 19. So it was actually the same cohort. Hmm. And sometimes it was, you know, now they're in college, and they're still at risk. So I think with regard to your question about social learning theory is, you know, you experience that trauma, you learn, that suicide may be something that's doable, real, you know, people talk about approach avoidance, maybe that balance changes, you know, and so on, and that that's, that does seem to stick with people. So with regard to also your last point and you know, identifying a town as a cluster, there is a trauma that a town experiences when they're experienced, you know, when the cluster occurs. There's an added trauma when they become the center of media attention. That if it's local media, that's one thing. If it's national media, it seems to be more of a problem. You know, this is more anecdotal. I can't say that it's, you know, that there's been research in this area. So that this really is anecdotal. But that we've seen that, I remember there was a, a cluster out west, and then it seemed to have, you know, been contained, the community seemed fine. A year later, it was covered in a very prominent national magazine, 
and then another cluster occurred so that it can re-engage, you know, whatever. You know, and sometimes you hear kids who there was a pact, then one died, then one felt guilty that they didn't, you know, that he didn't do it. And I say he because in this case it's he. And then it gets publicized again. I don't know what that mechanism is. Guilt, so on, you know, grief, depression. They'd already been suicidal. And then they then engage in the behavior. So there is that, there is that danger of not people who are offering help saying, you know, because the community will know if something's going on, they'll know it's going on. And that we use vital statistic data. So it was always about a year to two years after something occurred and the health department would say, oh, you found, oh, you, you identified it. You know, it's so they knew that something had happened. The community had known that something had happened, but to get national coverage really makes it harder for a community to heal. Okay. You know, well, mo on the most, yeah. at least we've seen anecdotally. And I, and I think that kind of brings us back to a, a good place to stop, which is that branch point you described in your PowerPoint up there, which is this, this branch between facilitation right. and inhibition. Right. And in some sense, everyone in this room as a journalist, when we're making our choices, lives there. Right. lives at that branch point. Awesome. And that's part of our conversation today.